I'm Craig Foster, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. The best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have an old-timer and a new-timer on the show. We've got Craig Foster and Newell Bringhurst. They're the authors of a few books, uh, three volumes of The Persistence of Polygamy, as well as Quest for the American Presidency. So we'll talk about Mormons who have uh, vied for presidency of the United States. It's not just Joseph Smith. Um, we'll talk about people like Eldridge Cleaver and uh, Bo Greitz and Ezra Tav Benson, to, to name just a few. So it's going to be a fun conversation, and then we're going to delve deeply into polygamy. So you won't want to miss this. Check it out. All right, well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm here with two amazing historians. We're at the home of Craig Foster, and you're, the, you're a first-time guest here on Gospel Tangents. I am. Yes. Could you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you went to school and that sort of thing? Well, I uh, um, graduated from BYU. Um, and I did all of my degrees at BYU, which uh, usually is, uh, what do they call that, academic suicide. But, um, <laughs> but that's what happened. I have a bachelor's and two master's um, from BYU. One was in history, and the other one was in library and information sciences. And I worked for over 30 years at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. Yeah. So uh, I believe Dr. Richard Bennett, my, my name twin, he was a library science guy as well, right? I think he was, yes. Um, I think along with his history degrees, he also was library. Well, fantastic. And so do you work? where do you work now? I'm retired. Oh, you're retired. I, I just recently retired. You're too young to retire, aren't I know. you? But um, I, I spent over 30 years at the Family History Library and and um, then uh, retired. So we can ask you all about family history or history, and, and you, you, you got everything covered, right? Yeah, and if I don't know it, I'll make it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, Newell, you're... Uh, three-time guest now, I believe, right, here on Gospel right. Tangents. So remind people where you used to work and, and uh, that sort of thing. I'm a retired professor of history and political science from College of the Sequoias, which is located in Visalia, California, where I taught for 25 years. Well, fantastic. Well, great. Well, you guys have teamed up on a couple of books. Well, Three book, four books, four, four books, four together. books. Let's yeah. we're we're here to talk about polygamy, but let's talk about especially since you mentioned political science because you have a political book that you guys worked on together. Well, we worked on a on a book entitled uh, "The Mormon Quest for the Presidency," and it went through two editions. It was obviously stimulated by the emergence of uh, Mitt Romney as a presidential candidate in. Uh, 2008, and we started work on it in uh, 2006, 2007, and what it basically consisted of is short biographical sketches of the uh, of, of ten people who had Mormon backgrounds or involvement with the church, who uh, sought uh, the highest political office in the United States, the presidency. And of course, we started out with Joseph Smith, and uh, we dealt with uh, the uh, elder Romney, uh, George Romney, who ran in 1968, and then Mitt Romney. Those were the three most prominent uh, people with uh, Mormon background who ran for president. But we also included some more obscure figures, including Eldridge Cleaver, who, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who I'm now doing a current research for an expanded study. He was one of them. He, he wasn't an, a Mormon when he ran in 1968, but he later joined the church. He was one. And the other one that's kind of had a, a, a kind of an interesting reputation was Sonia Johnson, who ran as a Green Party candidate in 1984. Of course, she was a, excommunicated for her strong advocacy of, uh, of ERA. And then there were some other lesser known. Well, one of them that was not so less known was uh, Orrin Hatch. He actually launched a candidacy for president in the year 2000, running against uh, uh, George W. Bush in a crowded field. He didn't get past the first primary, but 
you know, he achieved prominence as, as a leader of the Republicans in the Senate. So his prominence uh, made him a, a choice for inclusion in the book. And then we included uh, some other interesting people, Ezra Taft Benson, who later became president of the, uh, of, of the LDS Church. He uh, was a contender in 1968. And uh, he, uh, he sought to be on the ticket as a vice presidential running mate with George Wallace on the uh, American Independent ticket. And that, that was an interesting case study because he, he unsuccessfully approached President David O. McKay for permission to do that. At that time, he was a senior apostle, and, and uh, President McKay said, well, that wouldn't look very good for the church running on this racist third-party ticket with George Wallace because we're already having enough difficulty with this uh, with the issue of blacks and 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 the race issue and George Wallace was the guy segregation now segregation today segregation forever Cor uh, correct along those lines. and and that was and uh, that was uh, that was an interesting uh, and and he also toyed with the idea before he was trying to get on with George Wallace of being on a separate presidential ticket as uh, uh, as a presidential candidate on this constitutional uh, 76 called the uh, spirit of 76 political party that they were trying to form it was actually an offshoot uh, kind of an, uh, a political action group with the uh, with, with, with 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 the John Birch Society like a pack and they they uh, they had a close association with the John Birch Society, and he wanted to, he he was proposing to be on a ticket with uh, Strom Thurmond mm -hmm. as his Carolina. running mate, and that but that all in that same 1968 election. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it showed the political activism and involvement uh, uh, and uh, extreme right wing politics of uh, Ezra Taft Benson. Very good. Craig, what were your contributions to that book? Well, I uh, wrote about uh, Mitt Romney, for example, and, uh, and uh, wrote about uh, a couple of the, the others. Um, um, and uh, another, you, another one that, uh, that ran in 68 was uh, George Romney. Um, also, um, so George was running against Ezra. Um, <laughs> yeah, running against Ezra. Yeah, if I remember correctly, he was in '68. Yeah, '68. Yeah. There were three potential candidates, three uh, present and fortune uh, for future Mormons that ran in '68. Yeah. Eldridge Cleaver, who later became a member of the church, Ezra Taft Benson, and of course George Romney. And that was a real tragic story in a way because. He, uh, he was a front runner going into that election. He was clearly the front runner for the nomination. And he, he made the mistake, speaking honestly and forthrightly, saying that we'd been brainwashed on Vietnam because by that time we were deeply involved in the Vietnam War. And, uh, and, and he said, we're being brainwashed by the Johnson administration because every time Lyndon Johnson, he didn't say this, but the joke was that, that you could tell when Lyndon Johnson was lying because his lips moved. But, but anyway, uh, uh, so he, he pointed, called out Johnson for, you know, uh, the uh, being brainwashed on the Vietnam War. And that was turned viciously against him. Because I, I, I think of the, what could have happened in this country if, if George, Wall, George uh, Romney had been elected uh, over, because Richard Nixon eventually emerged as the candidate and we had Watergate, resignation, and extreme distrust in the government. Whereas George Wallace, in my opinion, was George an, Romney. George, uh, Romney. Uh, yeah, George Romney was an extremely honest, straight speaking. Uh, individual, uh, I think one of the better Republicans that we've had in you know in, in that time. And he went on to be the housing and urban yeah housing, yes. under Nixon yeah. yeah and and his wife ran unsuccessfully for the Senate. A lot of people sort of forget that that she ran in 1970 for the Senate. So they were very much of a political uh, activist family. And young Mitt Romney. Uh, was was campaigning for his mother when she ran. I I think he was on his mission when his father ran for president in '68. Yes. Hmm. 
And so, Craig, you were the primary author for George Romney? No, uh, um, uh, he was the primary author. Okay. I helped with uh, George Romney, and I was the primary author of uh, Mitt Romney. And to be brutally honest, I can't remember who else now. <laughs> um, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, we we, there, we might also mention, and, and Craig uh, hasn't mentioned this, that we were we were going to configure the book somewhat differently than we did, and actually there was a spinoff, and you might want to talk about that. That your 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 a book that came out uh, that you had published by Greg Colfer. You might want to yes. tell uh, Rick about that. Well, we uh, we did so much research on uh, Mitt Romney that, um, <laughs> and, and obviously not all of it could fit into uh, into our volume. Right. So what I did was um, because of all the research that I did on Romney, and I uh, did quite a bit um, dealing with um, with uh, the Mormon question, basically of uh, Romney's being a Mormon that um, I uh, uh, wrote a book that came out the same year as our other one uh, titled um, A Different God, Mitt Romney, The Religious Right, and The Mormon Question. Mm -hmm. And so I really focused on, um, on that question. I, I wrote a biographical part about uh, Romney and, uh, and his life and career, but then I went into uh, more detail on uh, his Mormonism and how that became an issue um, there in in the primaries because uh, that's that's where the religious right had at least at that time had a lot of influence was in the uh, in that process of the primaries and and with the grassroots and ultimately. I, I think that was one of the major reasons why Romney lost the first time uh, was because of his, his Mormonism. To John McCain. Uh, lost to John McCain, exactly. And um, by the time that he ran again, I think that uh, in part, you know, they, some of the prejudices had been broken down. There were, I know that there were those who did not vote for Romney uh, purely because he was was a Mormon. There were others who didn't vote for him because they didn't think he really was conservative. But um, but I know that there were some who didn't vote for him because he was Mormon in both uh, his 2008 run and his 2012 run. But uh, so that that book dealt more specifically with that. Well, very good. Uh, the other interesting one, uh, if you guys could just comment on it, because I, I just heard an interview with Sonia Johnson on Radio West uh, this week. Um, can you talk a little bit about her unsuccessful bid for presidency? Well, it uh, it was she was running as a third party candidate, and uh, and and she didn't really garner all that many votes because it was the uh, uh, it, it, it was the Green. It, it, it was the Citizens Party. Actually, I said I mistakenly said the Green Party, but the Green Party grew later out of the Citizens Party. It was uh, it was uh, uh, put together at, at that time, and and uh, she was, uh, as I recall, the first candidate that was. It was kind of an environmentalist, uh, uh, kind of a leftist party, not as far left as the Peace and Freedom Party, and under, under which. Uh, under which Eldridge yeah. Cleaver ran in '68, but uh, uh, she, uh, you know, she she uh, ran on on women's rights, on on environmental issues, and uh, I I must confess I I can't recall the number of vote, you know, the percentage of the vote, but I. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was uh, under one percent. It wasn't yeah. a it wasn't a huge number of votes, and 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 because it was a small fledgling party, she didn't even get in un, uh, in the on the ballot in all 50 states. Right. I think it was only a small right. percentage of, of of actually the states. I think as I as I recall, I, I I don't think it was even 20 states. Yeah, I don't think it was no. either. I'm trying yeah. to remember, but. Um, it, I, but you are correct about uh, that. She it was under one percent. Yeah, well under of the yeah. of the votes uh, that that her party, she and her party, 
Yeah. Thought. Uh, there's one more I want to ask you about, and then we'll move on to the, the, our topic at hand. Bo Greitz. He, uh, he, he was really another sure. one, yeah. Yes. And he ran under the, uh, what was the label of the party? I forgot I'm now. The remember. Constitution, it was, I think it was Constitution it was Party. Constitution, I thought it was Constitution and something else. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, and, and he, he was an extreme, uh, I guess you'd call him a right-wing somewhat conspiratorial, apocalyptic, uh, uh, you know, uh, seeing the end times not that far off, anticipating the, the coming of the millennium. He made most right-wing look moderate compared to Yeah, he, yeah he, he made, he made uh, Ezra Tapp Benson look like a flaming liberal in terms of, uh, in, in terms of his poli politics. Uh, kind of an interesting character, though, because... Uh, I, I, I guess it, <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm, I'm speaking out of turn, <laughs> but it was Craig's brother uh, kind of embraced his candidacy, so you might want to go into a little bit of that family yes, confession. He, uh, <laughs> he, he did, um, uh, and uh, he kept trying to talk me into uh, uh, voting for him, and <laughs> I would just smile and say no, and, and uh, then after... I think was, we all have relatives. Like yeah, that. <laughs> it was after the election and when um, when some of his racism came out. Oh, and my brother, he he came to me and he, and he made the comments something like, "Why didn't you tell me about that?" And I said, "Well, I wasn't really sure." And uh, and so he he loudly said that he regretted voting for him, but oh. um, but uh, yeah, he he was. Uh, he was a gung ho supporter, um, at least uh, through the election. <laughs> and he he be, he got on even fewer ballots in fewer states right. than what uh, then I think, Sonia Johnson yeah. did, uh, you know, yeah. back in eighty eighty four. I'll bet and he got more votes in Utah than Sonia did. That, that <laughs> yeah, I, I I believe you're right about that because the bulk of his, the votes that he got were in two states, Idaho and, and Utah. Right. Yeah. That that was the bulk of his support. Yeah. yeah. He's very much of a regional candidate as well. Well, very good. All right. Well, let's move on to the topic uh, that we, we brought here. You guys have written uh, three books uh, pr called The Persistence of Polygamy. Why don't you show those, hold those up there, Craig, and uh, tell right. us about, uh, first of all, kind of give us an overview of all three volumes, and then we'll, we'll dive into each one. Okay. Well, we have uh, The Persistence of Polygamy, Joseph Smith and the Origins of Mormon Polygamy. And the essays deal with uh, plural marriage during the lifetime of Joseph Smith and uh, really do address the origins, uh, questions of, um, of when did it start, um, how did it start, uh, etc. So that uh, pretty much covers that. And then uh, we have the persistence of polygamy from Joseph Smith's martyrdom to the First Manifesto, 1844 to 1890. And uh, there are some uh, really good essays in there dealing with um, the, the continuation of plural marriage, the um, uh, talking about uh, the, the time of the raid, and um, also uh, covering uh, issues uh, such as um, uh, plural marriage uh, in the RLDS Church, uh, um, the black, the question of um, of uh, blacks and priesthood, and was there a connection to plural marriage uh, with that? And um, also uh, in in the persistence of uh, of polygamy in the first volume, we had uh, a an appendix in which we identified the known wives of. Uh, Joseph Smith, and talked about the dynamics of why these women uh, might have been um, approached by Joseph Smith to be plural wives as opposed to other women. And then in The Persistence of Polygamy, the second volume, we have the wives of the prophets from, uh, from Brigham Young through Heber J. Grant. So all of the polygamists other than Joseph Smith since we had already covered him, but we discussed that in this volume. And then in the largest volume, which uh, Newell made a very good point that um, uh, this, 
this has more pages than the two volumes combined, uh, and it is uh, The Persistence of Polygamy, Fundamentalist Mormon Polygamy from 1890 to the Present. Uh, what was the present at that time. And uh, in that, again, some wonderful essays dealing with uh, uh, the early the early days of fundamentalism, uh, dealing with aspects of uh, the, the, the fundamentalist groups, and uh, going along with Joseph Smith's plural wives, um, Brigham through uh, Heber J. Grant's plural wives, we have um, the plural wives of the leaders of the polygamous groups. And uh, so an essay dealing with that, but uh, also uh, essays on other topics. Did you want to add anything, Newell? Yeah, I, I, I was just going to say that uh, we, we had originally intended only doing one volume when we started out on this project back in... Uh, in, in 2007 is when the genesis of this uh, project came about. And we quickly found uh, that it wasn't going to be adequate to do it all in one volume. I, I might further add that in, in uh, each volume kind of has its own distinctive characteristics in terms of the way that we structured it. In the first volume, where we're talking about uh, Joseph Smith, we, we deal with kind of a counter, point counterpoint approach in which we tackle very controversial aspects of how Joseph Smith uh, dealt, you know, handled polygamy. For example, uh, uh, there, there are, are two uh, counter uh, essays covering uh, underage uh, women that uh, Joseph, Joseph Smith married. Was that uh, was that out of the norm for that time in terms of men marrying, uh, you know, teenaged wives? And, uh, and, and Craig, in one essay, argued that it wasn't that far out of the norm, whereas Todd Compton argued that it was uh, not quite within the norm of what was acceptable in that society. And uh, there, there, there were other essays, uh, for instance... Uh, uh, I, I think one of the outstanding features that that I that uh, I thought was brought out very clearly was the impact and influence of uh, Doctrine and Covenants 132. There are actually three essays in Volume One dealing with uh, uh, Doctrine and Covenants 132, which is the foundation scripture for uh, for polygamy, and. Uh, and, and I, I, I dealt with the kind of the uh, structure and texture to show that 132, while it was a foundational uh, basis for polygamy, dealt with more than just polygamy. It wasn't just a polygamy uh, revelation, but it dealt with, uh, with a wide array of, of doctrinal uh, developments that form the foundation of the faith right down today. Uh, you know, specifically eternal progression uh, uh, and uh, worlds without end uh, and, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of uh, the importance of, of, of temple, you know, of marriages for here and for, you know, for time and eternity. And, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I tried to show that uh, kind of that there, there's been a lot of controversy over 132 and, and, and focus well. Why don't we just get rid of 132 and we get rid of this polygamy problem? And I said that that's not possible because 132 is such a complex, complete revelation that that wouldn't be possible. And one and 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 uh, Craig dealt with uh, 132 from the uh, point of view of establishing kinship. So he took a, a somewhat different approach. I took more of a structural approach. And then a third essay in the volume that deals with 132 is the response of the community of Christ to uh, 132, how they have grappled with, uh, with that, uh, with, with that uh, because it, it, it's equally controversial within the uh, RLDS community, or now Community of Christ. What, what do you have to share on, the, on 132 there? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as Newell said, I approached it uh, in terms, very much uh, in terms of, of um, 
the, the eternal progression and the, uh, um, and the eternal family. But I, I really looked at it as, as kind of a, um, a culmination of uh, what Joseph Smith had learned and then taught over the years regarding, uh, uh, regarding the eternal family, uh, the nature of family. And uh, so my focus was very much on um, kinship, the eternal family, um, and and all of those aspects of of it uh, coming together as kind of a uh, uh, the results of his developing uh, doctrinal questions dealing with that. It it uh, harkened back to the fact that I uh, spent my career uh, doing family history and um, and uh, being involved with. Uh, aspects of family history, including temple work. So for me, uh, that's how I looked at it. I wanted to approach it from that uh, that kind of a background there. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Neil brought up a good point there. You'll see, especially in the ex-Mormon community, calls to decanonize 132. Um, I just had a question on Facebook. Somebody asked me, is polygamy still doctrine? And my answer was... As long as 132 is canonized, it's still doctrine. Yes. Um, wh- wh- what would you say to people that would say, let's get rid of 132, let's decanonize it? <laughs> I, would, I would say exactly the same thing that Noel said. You cannot get rid of 132 without throwing out a lot of other uh, very important doctrine within the church. Doctrine dealing with eternal families, eternal progression. Uh, all of that uh, is is just in 131 and 132. Uh, there is so much there. There are so many uh, doctrinal layers, so to speak. And uh, plural marriage is is just one aspect of 132. You know, so you either throw out the whole thing, or I guess you could go and try to, you know wedge out uh, where uh, plural marriage is mentioned but but what you would be doing is you'd be watering down the the whole uh, the whole section and so uh, and I have responded to people who have suggested well let's take out the the polygamy part or let's get rid of 132 and my comment is at least from where I'm coming from doctrinally I cannot imagine how you could uh, get rid of that and still have uh, what we believe in terms of of eternal families, celestial marriage, uh, eternal progression, all of that. So one of the parts that really I struggle with Mm -hmm. (laughs) is the part where it's... The Lord says to Emma, I want to say Joseph says to Emma because it feels more like Joseph to me, but that Emma will be destroyed if she doesn't embrace this. Could, we, could we cut out those verses? Would that be okay with you? <laughs> well, it, I, it's, it's really, a, I, I, I think it, it'd be like, uh, if you start saying, well, what should we take out of there? It'd be like uh, an unwinding a, a ball of, of, of twine or something. I think, I, I, where, would you, where would you stop? Uh, I mean, I, because it's... it's uh, if you read it very carefully and study it very carefully, which which I did in the process of putting this essay, because I have to confess, I I, I was somewhat ignorant of uh, of the impact and implications of 132 when I started studying, and I thought, wow, this is probably the the mo- both the most complex and the most controversial revelation that uh, Joseph Smith brought forth during his ministry. And uh, yeah, it, 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 as Craig has said, it represents the culmination of uh, Joseph Smith's theological evolution by the time that, you know, by the time, by the time of his martyrdom comes forth in one, you know, in, in 18, in Ju- July of 1833. And uh, as, a, as a historian, as an observer of the evolution of 
Joseph Smith's uh, theological development, which is something I've become more and more interested in as I've gotten older. I've always wondered where Joseph Smith would have gone with all of this if he hadn't been killed abruptly in 18, uh, 1844, because by this time he'd moved, to, you know, he'd moved to other controversial theological aspects. For example, and it's beyond the scope of, of polygamy, the idea of uh, of, of of having himself uh, crowned king and establishing the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, you know, he was moving very rapidly in that direction. I even had this conversation a little bit with Mike Quinn. Uh, uh, some some years ago, I said, "Well, because he'd done so much work in this area, where do you think he would have gone?" And and we kind of sort of speculated back and forth in detail that I won't go into. One of my more interesting discussions with the late uh, Mike Quinn, I, I said, "Where do you think Joseph would have gone?" And and I you know and you know we kind of went back and forth a little bit. He as a, a, a true it's kind of interesting ironically because he as a as as a strong true believer who has been excommunicated, and me as a skeptic and doubter who is still uh, a, you know a, a, a member of record of the church. I mean it's kind of comical in a way, but to me that's what makes uh, studying LDS history and doctrine so endlessly fascinating. Oh, endlessly. <laughs> this is why I've been doing this for six years. <laughs> so, well, what do you think there, Craig? On what? <laughs> um, well, what I'd like to, I want to, I personally want to emphasize the parts about Emma. Will be oh, yes, destroyed. okay, that's right, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, you know, so <laughs> I, I look at that, and I have studied uh, 132, uh-huh. I've read it a number of times and studied it very carefully. Yeah, I don't particularly like that part either. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I don't, I don't view it as harshly as a lot of people do. Uh, in terms of, uh, well, did that mean God was going to strike Emma down any moment? I don't think that was uh, was the message that was trying to be put across and I and I wonder if Emma even took it that way I think that uh, the uh, be destroyed I think meant more along the lines of eternal progression as opposed to you know a but still that's quite big a big bolt of lightning that, coming that, out that's a bigger threat than a, a that is life, a very right? big threat obviously but uh, the um, you know that's the that is to a degree what Joseph was trying to teach to everyone at the time uh, I believe was that in order to continue progressing this this and this had to take place uh, and not the least of which being celestial marriage so do I have a problem with it being in there Probably not, just because I would feel like I was missing something if it wasn't in there. And if we learned tomorrow that, yeah, here's here's a whole part that was taken out of of what was originally presented, then I would feel like I was missing out. Uh, because the church I, was hiding something. Yeah, something. exactly. I want to have the full picture as right. much as possible. And I always want to have the full picture, even when it's uncomfortable. And that part is a little uncomfortable, mm-hmm. to say the least. But that's how I view it. And, and so I would be disappointed if we took it out, uh, because I'd rather that we address it, talk about it, maybe not even agree with each other, but at least we're, we're aware of it. We, we are uh, aware of a fuller picture than what we would be otherwise, and then we can discuss it, and probably all of us uh, go away with, uh, to one degree or another, thinking, well, that was a little harsh, mm-hmm. because it, it was. It was harsh. Yes. Very harsh. Yeah. yeah. Well, and... Another question I'd like to to bring up for both of you um, is Denver Snuffer. You know, I know he now believes that Joseph wasn't a polygamist, but when he wrote his book, I believe it was Passing the Heavenly Gift, if I have that right, 
he said that <clears throat> 132 really was four revelations and that the sealing power and the um, polygamy were conflated together. And I don't know how you feel about that. I don't know that that's historically accurate, but emotionally, I like that. I would love to decouple the sealing power from polygamy. Um, do you agree that you could read 132 that way, that you can decouple sealing from polygamy? Uh, well, I, 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 I don't think so, because uh, the whole idea of polygamy is to, uh, you know, it was partially to not only bring in righteous seed into the world as, uh, you know, in, 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 in conjunction with the uh, doctrine of, uh, of pre-existence, but by uh, having an increase in progeny, this enables you to uh, go evolve toward godhood and become a, a, a god or have a, over a world of your own. I mean, that, that's implied and, and, and strongly suggested because it, it, it's all interconnected. I mean, it, was, uh, it wasn't just all of a sudden, oh, let's put polygamy in there. I mean, Joseph Smith, uh, in my opinion... Uh, carefully thought out this whole uh, theological superstructure that these that that the idea of eternal progression, the idea of polygamy, the idea of sealing for time and eternity, were all linked together. I you know I'm no theologian, but I would tend to disagree with that because I see this There's as, no way as to yeah because I I see it as interrelated. I see it as as carefully thought out or inspired, depending on your belief. He either carefully thought it out or he was divinely inspired that this all kind of goes together. Uh, is that, how do you feel about that, Craig? Well, I'm going to sound like a politician now, so we'll go back to um, <laughs> our earlier discussion. Now, um, what I, I'm going to say yes and no. <laughs> and and uh, let me say explain the yes part, and then uh, I'll explain the no part. I do see aspects of the sealing power uh, being not completely tied to plural marriage, and that is because we have sealing of, of children to parents, and, uh, and uh, we also do have sealing of, of spouses where you know they were monogamous however i'm i'm emphasizing on the ceiling of children to parents obviously that doesn't need to that would not always uh, involve a plural marriage but the no part is i think as newell i think very uh correctly stated in terms of eternal progression and all of that, I think that uh, the sealing power uh, does basically emphasize the the plurality of wives as a part of of eternal progression. But I, I think that it's very complicated, and that's why I said yes and no. Because to me, speaking as a as a genealogist, there are aspects of sealing power. That uh, that wouldn't uh, per se involve a plurality of wives, and that would be sealing of of children to parents. I'd I'd add one other thing, uh, somewhat of a different aspect of this whole idea of polygamy and sealing. Are you know, as we're all well aware, the church is still practicing polygamy today, in a sense when uh, uh, the spouse of a of a leader, of a church leader, dies and he remarries. He generally, they usually, you know, all of the general authorities and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, I guess, I, I'm thinking of Dallin Oaks and I, I believe uh, President Nelson, uh, they've married, you know, they've remarried because their, their, their first wives died and uh, the sealing power there is, they're going to be, they're going to have both of those wives with them in eternity, and and uh, and I I don't know if it's if it's policy or if it's just practice that uh, 
when 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 uh, a high church official, be an apostle or or uh, somebody in in the first presidency, their their spouse dies, they they uh, almost always uh, I don't know cases otherwise they select somebody who hasn't been married before as their second wife. That was certainly the case with Harold B. Lee, whom I just did a biography because he he'd been sealed to his first wife. Uh, and then she died uh, before him, and he remarried, and, and, and so he was practicing polygamy when he uh, married that second wife, and it'll be sealed to her in the hereafter. So you've got that aspect of sealing, you know, as, as, as a part of polygamy. And I'm going to respond to that. <laughs> um, and and uh, interestingly enough, I had a, a similar discussion just a little, little over a week ago with a, a fundamentalist friend who is the head of one of the fundamentalist groups. We'll leave it at that. We're not going to give any names. Um, um, but um, we talked about that uh, because I, I commented that that's actually one of my biggest pet peeves um, is when people say, well, Dallin Oaks and uh, Russell Nelson, they are polygamous. And my comment is, no, they're not polygamous because to be a polygamist, you have to have two living wives. Now, once they die, then... They'll have a plurality of wives, and and then there you go. Uh, it, it, but right now they're not polygamous. Um, uh, they yes, they have been sealed to two different women, and and by the way, that uh, that does seem to be a thing with uh, with the leaders of the church. However, I have friends um, who. Uh, have had a spouse die and have then been uh, sealed to uh, someone else in the temple. So it, it, it comes right down to just regular uh, rank and file members will have the same situation uh, where they are sealed to more than one, with one living and one dead. But um, that uh, to me, that that is not, at least it is not currently polygamy uh, now, once they die, then they'll have two wives in the hereafter. Uh, it, but um, policy with uh, with the church, and we 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 would tell people this all the time when they if they came into the family history library and they'd say, "I had an ancestor; she was married to three different men, uh, and you know they they each died, or she was married to a couple of men and uh, divorced the one, but." All of these kids came from the one that she uh, divorced. How shall we do that in terms of sealing? And we would say, seal her to all of them. And they'd go, seal her to all of them? And we would always say, they'll, they'll figure it out on the other side. Uh, so, so in terms of sealing... You have... So we you, believe in polyandry. We believe in polyandry. You have men... Being sealed to more than one woman, you have women being sealed to more than one man, it, because we figure on the other side, you know, after all is said and done in the mortality, that they'll they'll figure out what what yeah you know, what works best. I'm glad you mentioned that because I know that came up in Greg Prince's book on on the McKay biography, that it was actually Howard W. Hunter that suggested, hey, we don't know if a woman's been married to multiple men. A lot of times we don't know who she wanted to be sealed exactly. to. Exactly. So we just seal them to all of them, and President yeah. McKay approved that. Yes. So so we do believe in polyandry, just not living polyandry. It's got you got to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, interesting. Uh, so a couple of other questions I I want to ask you guys about. Um, cause th- these are, so it's funny to me how often I've talked about polygamy and people still ask me the same questions. Um, <clears throat> the Fanny Alger affair, um, <clears throat> I think it's dated between 1834 and 1836. Um, there are some people, uh, Blake Osler and, Dan- and Don Bradley that make the case, and I think it's a pretty good case, it, it, uh, that, um, the sealing to Fanny occurred after 
the visit of Elijah in the temple in 1830, March of 1836. Uh, I, I know Brian Hales and most other people put it a little before that, 1835, before the temple. And I know Mark Staker um, has made the case, uh, I think he's kind of a minority opinion, that when Peter, James, and John restored the Melchizedek priesthood, that they gave Joseph and Oliver the sealing power as early depending on when you want to date Melchizedek Priesthood right. realization, to either 1829 to even as late as 1831. And Mark makes the case that um, if even if we go with 1831, that was before Fanny Alger, and so Joseph had the power to seal. Um, where do you guys weigh in on that controversy? Well, uh, first of all, I do want to mention uh, that Don Bradley had an essay in here about that. Oh, good. Yeah. It, because it, it was an excellent one, and it is titled Mormon Polygamy Before Nauvoo, you know, question mark, the relationship of Joseph Smith and Fanny Alger. Okay. In, and, and it was in that essay that he first uh, put forth his, his argument uh, regarding uh, Joseph Smith and Fanny Alger. And he... He came right out and asked, okay, was it an affair or was it a plural marriage? And if so, why wasn't it an affair or why was it? Why wasn't it a plural marriage or why was it? And uh, I think he did a very good uh, job in, in explaining that. And I, I want to give kind of a little uh, teaser um, for those who have not read the the book or read his essay. I heard it, his presentation. At MHA okay, so years you ago. remember what he found? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's that was really very interesting of what he found in uh, Oliver Cowdery's letter. Uh, so so that is definitely. I think he does a good job of of placing it as a marriage and and when it was. Now, for me personally, that's how I view it. I don't view. You think it was after the Kirtland dedication? I think that um, I think that it was a plural marriage. Now, I I think that uh, that the sealing power was not uh, restored until uh, the the vision in the Kirtland Temple. So I'm not. I don't support Mark Staker's argument. I I do think that the sealing power was restored at that time and uh, the however i also take of uh, the approach that um, even if the relationship had begun beforehand that wouldn't be the first time that uh, that there had been aspects of of a doctrine taught or practiced before it was officially uh uh taught or practiced. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? So I personally wouldn't have a problem, but I can understand concern of other uh, people about that. Was the timing correct or not? For me, that's never been an issue because I've seen examples of, of different things happening throughout church history, maybe not taking a plural wife before you're supposed to, but, but uh, I've seen other aspects. So I usually am fairly you know, uh, fairly open uh, in in regard to, okay, I can see, I can see that, uh, for example, a teaching about uh, that um, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. Well, that was certainly being taught, or at least being discussed, before Joseph officially taught it. So I, I use that as an example of where the principle was there, it was being discussed before it officially started. Well, that phrase came from, was it Wilfred Lorenzo Woodruff Snow? Lorenzo Snow, Snow, yeah. In the 1880s or something? Well, he first uh, uh, came up uh, with this and, and talked with Joseph about it. He talked with Joseph in... in uh, about 1840, was it 43, early 43, uh, before Joseph ever taught it. And he said, that is correct principle. You know, God revealed that to you, but don't be openly preaching that 
until I do. Uh, so, so that's just one example there mm -hmm. of where it was in the works already. It just had not been uh, officially made official yet. Do you have anything to add there, Newell? No, I think you pretty well covered it. Although getting back to the whole uh, Fanny Alger thing, I, I, I guess I'm still skeptical whether it really was a, a, a polygamist marriage. I, I'm, I'm kind of in, in this other camp, and I, uh, because I, uh, it, it, it there, there's a, such a scan, you know, a, a, a little amount of evidence, even that that. Uh, uh, Bradley has managed to dig up, and I, I, I think uh, I, I tend to think that the first real, uh, what I would call uh, recognized, I don't, you know, I would say recognized plural marriage would be Louisa Beeman, who, who, uh, I, I, because that that would coincide with uh, the evolution of uh, Joseph Smith's developing theology on that whole structure of what polygamy is meant to accomplish and uh, I, 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 you know, they, they, there was discussion about plural marriage with Indians and stuff like that that's early as 1831 mm -hmm. but I don't, you know, I, I, I think it was in, in, in the realm of, uh, well, ideas maybe with eugenics, the idea that, uh, you know, by intermarrying with, with uh, Indians uh, it, they'd be, help them to become White and delightsome, as discussed in the Book of Mormon, uh, and and you know it was it, it wasn't widely practiced, and uh, but you know there, there there were these discussions going on and speculation on what should be uh, what what should be correct doctrine and practice, but like uh, Craig said, uh, these things were implemented somewhat later after the initial discussion and there there might have been you know Joseph Smith might have discussed with uh, Fanny Al Alger that I consider you my uh, plural wife you know he could have done that as early and, and this all speculation when he was involved with her uh, for whatever reasons but I, I, I don't see the real uh, beginnings of the implementation of polygamy coming until considerably later and then you know right after uh, Joseph marries Louisa Beeman and and starts taking other plural wives then he starts teaching it to others Brigham Young and, and others of his followers there's no evidence that he was teaching it to any of his followers at the time that he was involved with Fanny Alger that's my take on it <clears throat> Louisa Beeman would have been 1841 is that right uh, yeah I think it's 1841 yeah yeah, yeah. So, do you guys have a date for when you think the? Do you do you think it was an affair, not a ceiling, Newell? Uh, oh boy, yeah. You know the complexity of Joseph Smith's character. I, uh, I, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I maybe there's one side of him, and maybe I'm maybe humanizing him too much, that was really he was attracted to her and maybe felt that God intended for them to have this relationship, uh, you know, that this, because they were so attracted to one another, and that in his mind he felt that he was maybe practicing the, the, the precursor of, of polygamy, or, or, or in his mind he believed it to be uh, polygamy. But, I, I, but it wasn't, you know, it, 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 it didn't fit in with the other aspects of the theological development surrounding uh, you know, the, as as articulated in uh, in uh, D and C one thirty two, and that, that's how I see it. I uh, because uh, as I say, Joseph Smith was a complex character, mm -hmm. and I I I think that uh, very charismatic. I'm sure there there was a, a, an attraction, probably a, maybe a, a mutual attraction. But I don't know if I would put it in the realm of, of really a, a, a full-scale polygamous marriage, you know, in, in, okay. in, in the theological sense. And then this happened in 1835, is that what yeah, you I, I, is, Yeah, it was, wasn't that when Bradley dates it around 35, yeah, he, 35, uh, 34, he, 35? 35 yeah, uh, yeah. or so. Yeah. Uh, in the book, uh, we put here uh, anywhere from 34 to 35 or so. Yeah. Um, I view it... I view it as the beginning of plural marriage and that it, it went so wrong 
<laughs> but it was such an unpleasant experience for all involved oh, yeah. that uh, Joseph Smith held off trying to go into plural marriage again. Because he never there, did in Missouri at all, right? There, well, there's, there's um, circumstantial evidence that uh, uh, Lucinda Pendleton Morgan, uh, Harris, that he may have been sealed to her, but there's no, absolutely no evidence that uh, it was anything other than just a sealing. And uh, I think, yeah... That was much later, though, wasn't it? Well, that was, no, was it that was Missouri? circa about 1838. Oh, really? Um, is is what um, the estimates are, and I think uh, uh, Brian would uh, Brian Hales would say that it was around that time period, it, it, and I think he too would argue that it was probably just a ceiling. Uh, then you have. Um, then you have the marriage in 1841 there of, um, you know, of Louisa or Louisa Beeman. Um, and, and then after that, uh, Zina, et cetera. But uh, with, um, I think, you know, and this is just, once again, I'm just surmising. <laughs> yeah. it, we can all speculate. We, right. It, the, it uh, the the early days of plural marriage uh, involves a lot of speculation. I personally think that uh, he he tried a plural marriage with uh, Fanny Alger, and and it was such an unpleasant experience that uh, in his mind, okay, I'm done with that. And uh, then he was prodded along. Okay, I'll be sealed to to this woman. Is that good enough? No. And prodded along and, uh, until he really finally went into it, starting to, to marry a number of women. That's how I look at it. Uh, I could be completely wrong, but um, based on what I've read, what I've studied, I kind of look at it that way. And I'll be the first to admit I'm just speculating based on available sources. All right. Well, anything else we should finish up on Volume 1 before we move on to Volume 2? Yeah, yeah I think we pretty well covered Volume 1. Okay. Well, let's jump into Volume 2 then. That's uh, after Joseph's martyrdom to the Manifesto, right? 1844 mm -hmm. to 1890. Um, what, what, do we, what should we know about uh, Volume 2? Well, I think Volume 2, it... Uh, it, it, it goes into, of course, the period of uh, Brigham, uh, the period from uh, the martyrdom to the manifesto. And uh, the unique feature, I think, about, uh, about volume two that causes it to stand out, I think, from other studies of this period in polygamy is what we did in that was include an examination of other groups uh, other than the mainstream uh, LDS church under leadership of Brigham Young, who uh, either embraced or rejected uh, polygamy. We get into uh, the, the, the Cutlerites, we get into the, the followers of Lyman White, uh, and, and we get into Strangites. other, uh, the Strangites especially, because they, they were very, they were, you know, J uh, James J. Strang was the major rival to uh, Joseph Smith during this early, uh, during during the period of uh, right after the martyrdom, that was the major uh, opposition group, and so we've tried to we we try to include essays from writers who would discuss these other groups, and the essay that I did in particular for that volume was actually focused on how Brigham Young has been perceived. Uh, you know, uh, by writers as, as uh, you know, his involvement in polygamy, I, I entitled it, uh, Whatever Happened to All of Brigham Young's Wives? And it, and, and it, it because uh, there, the, uh, in a lot of the writings, particularly the writings about the life of, of Brigham Young after, after the manifesto, was to play down the practice of polygamy and, 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 and certain early 
biographies and writings on, on Brigham Young give you the impression that he never even practiced polygamy by uh, and uh, so if that you go was to what the I tried. House, to... It's hard to get him to even admit that he. Did <laughs> yeah, I mean it's uh, and and because it became uh, persona non grata or uh, uncomfortable to discuss this, we're going to leave this behind. It was sort of similar to the what happened after they lifted the black priesthood ban. We we want to move on. We don't want to discuss this anymore because we want to become a part of, considered as respectable and a part of mainstream American society. And that's what drove a lot of the biographical works on, on uh, Brigham Young, particularly those that had uh, official uh, church ampamata and, and that. Uh, they, just, they, they were just loath to, uh, you know, deal with the fact of Brigham Young's uh, polygamy. And... Uh, Craig, you, you, your essay, your, your contribution in that volume was, uh, go ahead. Uh, my contribution was um, The Wives of the Prophets. Uh, the, for, for each of the volumes, I was the one that kind of looked at the wives. Uh, so uh, I was the one that did the appendix in the first volume. And then I did the essay. It was originally going to be an appendix, but it was so big that Newell said, you know, go ahead and put this in into the main body. It, it, it makes more sense being there. And I and so that's what we did. Uh, and then in this one, I looked at the wives of the fundamentalist leaders. But uh, yes, it, it, it was a fun it was a fun essay to do in just finding out uh, the similarities and the differences of the wives of each of these leaders and, and uh, the connections of, uh, that, that they had. Uh, I, another essay I want to mention that I didn't do, but I think is a really fun one, is um, uh, the late Louis Wiegand. Um, he uh, was a member of the Community of Christ, and he wrote an essay that he had stumbled upon this when he was doing research. Uh, there were a number of families that were polygamous families that belonged to the RLDS church. Oh, really? Yes, they had uh, they had gone west with Brigham or whatever the oh, situation, okay. and then they then they were go backs. They went back uh, to the Midwest and joined the RLDS church and, and uh, they were told that they could keep their plural wives. So Clear they, back in the 1860s. Yes. So they had, they had plural wives. Now some no longer lived with the, you know, would pick one wife and no longer lived with them. Others lived with their wives. Oh, I didn't know. And that. Uh, going along with that, remember Dick Howard's, Essay which uh, on on polygamy among yeah with the, when they went to the uh, his essay he at the time Dick Howard Richard Howard was a historian for what was the RLDS Community of Christ Church and that is a fascinating essay about they when when the uh, RLDS was proselytizing in India they came across a number of in uh, India Indian. Uh, interested in joining the church who were polygamous who had who had you know they had plural wives and they wanted to become members of the RLDS and so they had a big uh, it was a major discussion a major it 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 it, it turned into a major issue yeah. uh, within the uh, community of Christ RLDS church and they finally said the they can become legitimate members the bottom line was they can become legitimate members of the RLDS church and 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 they is, issued uh, official mandates to that effect, yes, and even policy, yeah. yeah and I what think year was this approximately? Th this was in. Uh, was let's see the date. Nineteen sixty-seven to yeah, nineteen seventy-two. Yeah, yeah. When that the debate went on for that long until yeah. they, they they decided, yeah, made that. And decision. and I think they they had even a, a, a provision in their a section in their doctrine and covenants which affirmed yes, that fact. Right. Yes. Yeah, that that they went so far as to canonize that as. Uh, 
as, as official church policy. I, I was going to go back to Craig's excellent essay that became a part of the main body on uh, presidents who had plural wives. And I think one of the evocative things is that uh, the, the, the last president to have practiced polygamy or have plural wives was none other than Heber J. Grant, who was president during my lifetime. I was born in 42, and he was president until 45. By that time, his, his first two wives had died, so he just had one wife. But the interesting paradoxical thing about Heber J. Gant that has always intrigued me is that uh, despite the fact that he practiced polygamy, he became probably the most ardent, staunchest foe of polygamy, you know, uh, by cracking down on the fundamentalists. I, I, I find that absolute paradoxical. It, uh, it, it, it seems, it seems so, con it seems so counterintuitive that, uh, that he, here he was, he, he, he practiced the principle and then he turns with, uh, uh vigorousness against uh, the uh, the fundamentalists who are emerging because he sees them as a existential threat to uh, to the mainstream LDS church and by the uh, systematic uh, uh, you know I would say almost persecution requiring uh, requiring um, uh, what do you call uh, loyalty oaths and mm -hmm. everything else he helped to uh, spawn the growth of fundamentalism, you, you know, it's just like early Christian martyrs, which you're aware of, by the persecution by Diocletian and others of early Christian ma uh, martyrs, that spawned the explosive growth of Christianity within the Roman uh, Republic. And you could make a similar argument that uh, Heber J. Grant's vigorous uh, going after fundamentals, really, uh, as, as Mike Quinn has stated, uh, transformed them from a ragtag, mo ragtag movement uh, uh, into a cohesive uh, force. And, uh, and, and, and we talk more about that, of course, in Volume 3, but I, I, I find it ironic that he was the last polygamous president of the LDS Church. Another curious paradox. Well, it's funny because <laughs> I remember I had a conversation with Benjamin Schaefer. I mean, he's in a fundamentalist group, Christ mm -hmm. Church. And he said that uh, he's the true Brighamite and that, <laughs> that my church are Grantites because Grant really changed things. And I, I think you kind of tell why in kind of this persecution of the, of the uh, fundamentalists. Yeah. Was, was Grant the one... That went after uh, Richard Lyman? Uh, yeah, that yes. came down. Yes. And that's a curious case, too. The more <laughs> you read about that, it, you know, because he claimed that he was, uh, he was practicing polygamy when they caught him with that uh, second, uh, you know, that, that other woman that he was involved with. And uh, that, that, that uh, and, and I, 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 I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of, of whether, how, it's hard to say how, how, uh, how sincere he was, whether he was just trying to justify an extramarital affair or whether he considered that he was really practicing polygamy. It, it almost has eerie parallels with uh, Joseph Smith and Fanny Alger when you stop to think about it. <laughs> so tell people more because Richard Lyman was an apostle. Do you want to yes. tell us yes. more about that, Craig? So he, uh, <laughs> what is interesting is that he had first met uh, uh, this uh, lady, and for the life of me right now, I can't remember her name, <laughs> but uh, he met her because he was counseling. Was that in your Harold B. Lee book? I think yeah, I talk about that yes. when, they, when, they, when they kicked him out. Do you remember yeah. her name? Oh, boy. I, I, I've got the book. He was counseling her because she had previously been involved in a polygamous relationship. So that's how he yeah, first met yeah, her, was counseling right. Oh, she was in another room yeah, that, before that, and, yeah, and, exactly. Um, so she's a polyandry person. And <laughs> I, she had ended that relationship, okay. but uh, then they entered into their own uh, polygamous relationship. But I was going to tell you really quickly while he's looking that just to give you an idea of the impact that really plural marriage had on the church, that um, uh, 
just using the the LDS leaders, um, the presidents of the church, that uh, uh, with these six men from Brigham Young through uh, Hubert J. Grant, um, that uh, there were 98 wives and 225 children, and uh, each of uh, these from men... From the prophets? Is that what you're saying? Uh, the prophets. And uh, these, uh, uh, let's see, these, this means that for the first 150 years of the church, uh, from 1830 to almost the middle of the 20th century, were presided over by polygamists. And uh, to give you an idea of the continuing impact, um, I have here where I wrote that um, uh, that the last of these 225 children of these polygamous leaders to die was Frances Marion Grant, the youngest daughter of Heber J. Grant and Emily Harris Wells. Frances was the widow of the late U.S. Senator Walter F. Bennett of Utah and the mother of past U.S. Senator Robert F. Bennett. She died in 1995, 165 years after the founding of the church and 151 years after the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. She was Bob Bennett's mother? She was Bob Bennett's mother, and uh, she was the last of the 225 children born to these LDS leaders. And so, so pretty much in in everyone's lifetime that's going to be reading uh, these books, at least uh, right now, we had we had um, remnants of plural marriage with the the children of these uh, leaders, which makes it so why it's so hard to decanonize one thirty two, right? Yes, well, <laughs> very much so. If you want to look at it just in that yeah, way, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, interesting. I'm also trying to remember the Short Creek Raid. Was that under Grant as well? Uh, yeah, no. no, that was David O. McKay, 1953. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was under McKay. Okay. <clears throat> Very interesting. Well, uh, what other issues should we talk about between uh, eight, 1844 and 1890? Let's see. Uh, well, we've got Another to- essay that I really like was um, by uh, Stromberg. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Lori... Uh, Winter Stromberg. Lori Winter Stromberg. Yeah, the one on the uh, plural wives of uh, of uh, that were incarcerated in the uh, state penitentiary. That that was uh, and 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 because you you don't often hear about the women that were incarcerated no. for practicing polygamy. And she addressed and, yeah. uh, very quickly the about women who had to go on the underground um, and and who who had. Um, arrest warrants for them, but then she spent most of it on the women in the prison. Oh. And, and, and we'll go ahead and explain a little yeah. further on that. Uh, it's fascinating. Well, that that's pretty well, that pretty much covers it. I mean, they, yeah. they arrested them and they imprisoned. It wasn't a huge number. I think it was 20, 25, but it, was, a, it yeah. was significant enough that... Uh, you know, it showed that there wasn't discrimination, whether it was male or female. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't testify or disclose, uh, uh, testify against their husbands, and so right. that's why they were incarcerated. A really kind of a violation of, of basic uh, civil rights. There uh, were yeah. there, yeah, there were at least three or so of them in the prison, and then some were incarcerated, like in the in in the city jail or something. But uh, really fascinating. My own great grandmother. I've I've looked at the arrest warrant for for her, and they didn't even know her name. So they they uh, um, she used she used as an alias her mother's maiden name, and uh, so one of the warrants uh, was was for that uh, uh, was for that uh, um, uh, alias, and then another one was for, um, I think it said, unknown uh, Butler, because um, uh, Butler was the married name, and uh, that there were like two or three arrest warrants for her 
and that uh, it brings it home. And of course, you had so much plural marriage in your own family uh, um, that uh, y- y- you can really relate to the to the underground. I mean, it wasn't only men that were on the underground. Uh, and uh, we often forget that aspect that these women, they went through a lot. They uh-huh. went through a lot. <laughs> and in many ways, they went through more than the men, I think, in terms of, uh, of their having to also go and hide, you know, and it, it go out of state uh, to, uh, to avoid arrest or move from one town to another, use aliases, etc. We, we think of the men a lot, but the women, they went through. I was going to mention two other essays that are in this volume that sort of kind of uh, are uh, aspects that are overlooked during this uh, critical uh, middle period. One of them was uh, the, the essay written by Connell O'Donovan, uh, which uh, deals with uh, Brigham Young, African Americans, and uh, uh, Sism and the Beginnings of Black Priesthood and Temple Band. The uh, gets into uh, the fact that there was uh, uh, there the the, the, the uh, like uh, uh, the uh, William McCary affair. Right. Right, because he was a practitioner. He, he, he broke off from the mainstream church when was practicing polygamy. He was a former Bo- slave, right? Yeah, former slave. And uh, there's, in fact, been an excellent uh, biography written by him subsequent to this essay that Connell uh, Donovan wrote about uh, uh, William McCary and, uh, and, and his, uh, his practice of polygamy, particularly with white women. I mean, one of the was was the uh, his, one of his wives who was with him was the uh, and I can't recall her name she was uh, Lucy Stanton yeah Lucy Stanton thank you Lucy Stanton and 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 that caused a cause celebre within the uh, LDS church and and was a major factor in prompting Joe uh, Brigham Young uh, to uh, go toward the practice of black priesthood denial. And this was as early as 47, 1847, although it wasn't formally announced to the main body of the church until after the arrival of the saints in Utah in 1852. But this was a seminal event. And the perpetuation of, uh, of, of polygamy uh, was, uh, or perpetuation of black priesthood denial was, uh, was uh, you know just they they could you know the the unseemly association that polygamist Africans practice polygamy and we don't want to be associated with that image uh, that uh, if we if, if we allow blacks to be full members of the church they may want to take plural wives there that there was that logic or that reasoning that was was in there. But the other essay that I, I thought was really evocative that sort of takes a little bit of the opposite approach in terms of expanding the role and the assertiveness of women is the one by Andrew, Andrea uh, Radke Moss, where she talks about polygamy as being a major uh, catalyst for uh, getting women actively involved in the political process. I think one of the most evocative essays in the entire chapter, you know, showing how uh, uh, Mormon women, we're, we're going to prove that we're not downtrodden, uh, shrinking violet types, that we're going to go out there and, and militantly support the principle of, of the, the, the practice of polygamy as being a legitimate part of our, our faith and our practice and getting actively involved in the political arena, uh, creating this uh, uh, female activism. One of the interesting, uh, I guess, byproducts of this is that, uh, uh, you know, Utah wanted to give women the, the right to vote uh, during the territorial period and, and would have been the first... Uh, a part of the United States to do so, but then it was nullified by the um, 
by the Anti-Polygamist Act, the uh, uh, Stucker. Well, they did uh, have yeah. the right to vote. They had the right to vote, and, and then they took it away from. They took and, it away. And, and so they didn't. Edmund uh, Stucker. So when they wrote the first Utah Constitution in 1896, it included the right of women to vote, mm -hmm. and and it was a lot of it was due to this uh, uh, political activism on the part of women in defending the practice of polygamy throughout the late 19th century. Yeah. Very good. Well, I guess that's a pretty good summary of volume two then. Yeah, yeah, I think that pretty well covers it. All right. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Newell Bringhurst and Craig Foster. In our next conversation, we're going to talk a little bit with them about the uh, temple and priesthood ban and how that relates to polygamy. That, that all, virtually all of the groups uh, felt that, the, uh, that, that they went along with the... Uh, Brigham Young assertion the blacks not hold the priesthood and and uh, and they go along with the myth that it was Joseph Smith that started the practice and 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 they still hang on to all of the uh, traditional beliefs that it's because blacks were an accursed race descendants of Cain of Ham uh, and that they uh, uh, they they were uh, neutrals during the pre-existence. They they still embrace all of the traditional arguments as put forth in the mainstream church, uh, and and you know that that have since been rejected and or denounced. Uh, if you like what we're doing at Gospel Tangents, please support us. Go to gospeltangents.com and you can get full interviews as well as transcripts if you'd like those. So click here to subscribe and over here you can see some of our other great videos. Thanks again.